Amen. Acts chapter number 27, please, in the King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, you don't have a Bible. Say amen right there. Now, uh, it's good to be saved. Thank you, Pastor, the privilege to be here. Thank you, good brother, for the good message from the Word of the Lord. Thank you, Preacher Moore. And I'm going to be brief. Amen. I'm going to be as brief as I possibly can be. And I'm just going to mind the Lord. I, I've had four or five different messages on my heart. And as I sit there right before the preacher called on me, God nudged me to preach this. So it's good to be here. How many of you is born again saved by the grace of God? Okay. All right. Then you're going to the same heaven I am. Amen. Just because you don't know me don't mean you can't get with me. All right. I'm going to do the preaching. You're going to have to do the amen because if i got to do both of them, I'm going to be long-winded and mean. All right? Let's stand in reverence to the reading of the Word of the Lord. It's good to be saved, ain't it? Amen? Yeah. All right. Now, verse number 12. I'm just going to read one verse in Acts chapter number 27. Take it for granted that you know your Bibles. And a very familiar portion of Scripture, like the preacher's already said, every bit of it ought to be familiar this morning. And uh, you know that very well that this is the biggest storm that the Apostle Paul has ever been in his life. They went several days without seeing the sun, the moon, or the stars, and they're... They went without food, and they're, and they're seemingly in trouble. But if they'd have listened to the man of God, they'd have never went through any of it. Say amen right there. And the Bible said in verse number 12, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, notice that word winter, And the more part it by should depart thence, if by any means they might attain the Phoenix, and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lie toward the southwest and northwest. Let's pray. Father, help me. Help these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. And as I already said, this is one of the biggest storms the apostles ever been in his life. And uh, every one of us are going to be in storms in our life. Just as the preacher preached a moment ago, thank God that Jesus had come walking across the stormy waters of our lives. Amen. And rescue us when we need to be rescued. Amen. Every one of us are going to be in storms. Uh, but there's something going on here, Brother Simpson, uh, that I noticed several years ago. I, I think I can handle the darkness that the Apostle Paul's went through. Uh, going without seeing the sun, the moon, or the stars for some two weeks. I think I might can handle that. I think I might can handle all the depravity on this boat. Uh, very few people on this boat were saved by the grace of God. The majority of them were reprobates, God-haters, and God-cussers. I think I could have handled being around that crowd because once you get the grace of God in your heart, that's a crowd you're going to go after and want to be after. Amen. I think I could have handled that. I think I could have handled the fashion. I think I could have handled how deep it was. I think I could have handled the fact that I may have died on that trip. Amen. When you get saved, God will give you grace and a die by. Say amen right there. I'm glad one day, one of these days, we'll close our eyes in death and wake up in glory. Death is nothing more than a gateway to glory for the child of God. Thank him I could have handled that. There's one thing I know I couldn't handle. Had been that cold weather. Hey man, it was right smack dab in the middle of the winter. He's in the biggest storms got going on in his life, and it's cold outside. Hey man, I think I could have handled everything but that bitter cold weather. I want to preach on this simple subject this morning just for a few brief moments on how to stay warm in the storm. I'm going to tell you if you don't learn how to stay warm in the storms of life, when it's winter time, you'll freeze up and die and get cold on God. I tell you, these folk first thing to do when the storm comes. They want to go getting cold on God. Uh, there's things that happen when you get cold. Uh, number one, it'll affect your brain. Amen. You ever got cold on God and just wasn't thinking right? Seen somebody get cold on God and they just don't think right. They say when you get hypothermia uh, that you make wrong decisions. You ain't got no judgment. Yeah, they got cold and laid out of church on Sunday morning and just ain't thinking right. Uh, they got cold and wasn't reading the Bible, just wasn't thinking right. Uh, they got cold went back to drinking and just wasn't thinking right. I tell you, get cold on oh God. It's going to affect the way you think. It'll affect the brain. Not only did it affect the brain. You ever, you ever get around somebody and say, what in the world are they thinking? Hey, man to God, he's getting cold on God. It'll affect your brain, but not only will it affect your brain, it'll affect the blood. Uh, that person gets out and gets cold. That blood won't flow like it would when the, when the weather's right. If you're gonna, they say if you're going to get cut, I don't want to get cut. That's the best time to get cut is when it's cold outside because your blood's a little bit thicker than normal. Hey, man, I tell you, but, uh, people that ain't, uh, they get cold, they get 
get a, a bad relation, need a washing in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible still says in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I heard a preacher a while back make fun of people that use that verse. He said, you're anemic, you're weak. If you always run the first shot, one night I said, well, you believe what you want to, but I'm still glad it's in the King James Bible. Hey, Amen. It only wasn't good enough. It was not only good enough to save us. It's good enough to keep us and to wash us. Even now, well, how do you know you believe? I'm still believing. How do you know you repented? I'm still repenting. Amen. Thank God. How do you know that you cleanse? Because I'm still taking a bath in the blood of the Lamb of God. It'll affect the brain. It'll affect your blood. But then, third, it'll affect you and get bitter. That bitter cold out there. If people get cold on God, they'll get bitter. Bitter attitudes. Can't talk to the wife right. Can't talk to the husband right. Can't talk to their children right. Just well say man right there. Us preachers that get the word, we'll start taking our problems out on the congregations that we're preaching to. That takes a way to stay warm in a storm. And we don't need to get bitter. The devil knows he can't get our souls, so he's going to get our minds and get us bitter and backslid on God. But there's a way to stay warm in the storm for things that I've done. Number one, if you're going to stay warm in the storm, you're going to have to praise the Lord. And this ain't no deep theological message this morning. It's elementary. But I'm going to tell you something. We better get back to praising the Lord. It's been a few times, and I'm not against preaching. I love it. It wasn't preaching that helped me. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the songs that helped me. It's been a few times. The only way I could get out of something was to shout my way out and to praise my way out and to worship my way out. Ain't nothing like embarrassing the flesh and just raise your hands and praise it, God. If you study the life of the Apostle Paul, everywhere he went, he had something good to say about God. He's a praise in the Lord. Them seraphims and seraphims over there in Isaiah 6. Oh, that always amazes me that Isaiah and the year that King Uzziah died. Sound like he's going through a little bit of a storm to me. And uh, boy, he's, he loved King Uzziah and he was broken over that thing. And he looked up and they was flying around the throne of God. And the Lord and the train filled the temple. And seraphims had three sets of wings with one set to cover the face, with one set to cover the wings of their feet, and with one set they flew. And I've got to thinking about that they have taken their flight of worship brother Simpson I used to preach it that they were all in unison together saying it holy 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 but that's not the way it is the Bible said they cried one unto another that means they was taking turns that means one seraphim would say holy 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 then another one would say holy 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 and I want to ask you this morning when's it going to be your turn these folks say they've been around the fire of God and the power of God ain't never Never shouted, ain't never worshiped God. These people say they're born again. Ain't never had a good old fashioned couldn't help it fit. I'll never forget the first time I got the couldn't help it. Amen. My brother got saved by the grace of God. I shouted for three hours. Amen. The God, I'm telling you right now, if you're going to stay warm, you better praise God. I get so sick of a bunch of deadbeat Baptists to sit there and look at you like a calf looking at a new gate because you're excited about the grace of God. I don't like that shouting. I don't like that running. Well, you ain't going to like her. heaven, neighbor. Amen. I'm going to tell you, when we get there, you're going to shout. The Bible said in Revelation uh, that there's a crowd which no man could number with a loud voice, with a loud voice, uh, worshiping and praising the Lamb of God uh, that died for our sins. And if you're saved... Uh, You're a part of that crowd. And if you think I'm going to wait until I get there to worship God, you got another thing coming. Praise the Lord. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord. But them seraphims up there and they in their flight of worship. You ever seen a 747 take off? It's amazing. Sometimes I like to ride by the airport just to watch the airplanes land and come in. Boy, I don't see how they get all that metal up in there at one time. But you know what they do? As soon as they get up in the air just a little bit, they bring that landing gear up. And boy, they cover that stuff up. And you know what that means? They're not planning on coming down for a while. Them seraphims have got their landing gear covered up. And they ain't planning on coming down for a while. Amen. Got too many feet with their landing 
the gear dragging the runway. Hey, man, don't even get cranked up. Ain't even got checked out for takeoff. I'm going to tell you it's the will of God we worship Him. That's why we're going to regret it when we stand before God and that we did not praise Him like we should have. I tell you the best way to get rid of the molly grubs and the best way to get rid of a bad attitude and the best way to make it through is praise God. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise God. Not only that. Number two, I'll tell you how to stay warm in a storm. Simply pray. Hey, like that. Just pray. Paul gets out in the bottom of this boat. And the Bible said after a long absence, he come up and said, I just heard from heaven, and it's all right now. He said, sirs, be of good cheer. Ain't nothing like a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost prayer meeting. Amen. And I like praying with the brethren. And I like going to the mountain with the brethren and praying. We've had some times up there on the tops of them mountains, back here in North Carolina where I come from, up there in them low thickets, praying all night long, begging God to send revival. Done it more than once. But I tell you, brother, since the times that they wasn't nobody around the times when they wasn't nobody looking and God had come up in where I was and blessed me and embraced me and let me know that I wasn't alone and boy I tell you God would help you make it through a storm yeah you might have to go through it but there's ways to stay warm and there's a way to keep heat and prayer there's one of them prayer will do several things number one prayer will cheer you up verse number 22 he said, sirs, be a good cheer. Hey, Amen. Not only will it cheer you up, but then it'll calm you down. Verse number 24. Prayer will cheer you up, calm you down at the same time. Hey, amen. Thank God this crowd. What, Paul, what do you got to be cheered up about? What do you got to be excited about? And if you'd been where he was and just heard from heaven, hey, amen, you'd have been excited too. Prayer will cheer you up. Prayer will calm you down. But then verse number 31, prayer will give you confidence. He said, that angel told me that I was going to stand before Caesar. Hey, amen to God. I tell you why people ain't got confidence anymore. That's because they've been praying like they ought to. Let's preach it. I'm not talking about a bunch of cocky, proud, arrogant devils, but I am talking about confidence and boldness. And when we got boldness to go to the throne of grace, it'll give us boldness to go to the trailer park and to stand and preach the word of God. It'll give you confidence. It'll clean you up. Uh, prayer will not only clean you up, it'll stop the contention. Prayer gets you before Caesar. Prayer. Prayer. I don't y'all don't know me and I don't know you. Can I tell you the first prayer God ever answered for me? <laughs> it happened on a December 31st, 1995. I was out in my yard working on my truck. I'm ashamed to ever bit of this. I had a cooler full of beer in the back of my truck, liquor on my breath. No Gary Brown Jr. come by my house and invited me to church. I went in that church and the first preacher got up and preached. He preached against liquor, drinking, party, and doping, fornicating, adultery, lying, stealing, cheating, thieving. Don't you get mad when a preacher preaches against sin. It's the law we've transgressed, and it takes law preaching. That's our schoolmaster. And to bring us to Christ. He preached against every bit of it. I, my heart was pricked by the Word of God, convicted of the Holy Ghost of God. I put the keys to my truck in my hand. I was going to leave and go to a party. It was a watch night service. They broke for supper about 9 o'clock. I'd eat supper, and all the only reason I went was to eat anyway. And boy, I didn't know God was going to uh, get a hold of my heart. Went there that night, oh, what a fight. But something got a hold of me. And I was walking out. I was going to go party. And uh, the preacher, the pastor of the church, reached out and put his hand on my shoulder he said son I want you to stay we got a surprise for you I'd been used to getting kicked out cussed out run off beat up and fighting it and fussing what used to nobody loving on me brother Chris what used to have nobody having compassion on me and I said yes I'll stay and put the keys back in my pocket went in there and old brother Dwight Banks from Waynesville North Carolina got up he was running the pews he was excited and I said I ain't never seen nothing like this for my life hey man to God make a long story short I got I got on that altar that night and God answered my first prayer and it went a little bit like this. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm rotten and I'm a hypocrite. Oh dear God, would you save me by the grace of God and that night when I knelt my blood fell, God reached further down that I could reach up and answer my prayer and deliver me by the grace of God. Woo! Hallelujah. 
Amen. Pray. I've watched them answer several prayers. The Reader's Digest back years ago, and I'm not big on the Reader's Digest, but they got something worth repeating in an illustration. I'll repeat it, okay? Reader's Digest had a had a um, had an article in there years ago, and Brother Simpson, it was about answered prayer, and uh, so they got they got to reading that thing, and I got to noticing uh, they, they, they was looking at that. How that they back in I think it's World War Two may have been World War One. There's, there's a group of military uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, USA and I can't remember if it was the Marines or the Army or whoever it was. And they got on this beach and they wanted to take this island for America. And so they get up there and they already got a flagpole raised up. And the sergeant looks at one of his men and says, "Oh, I don't want you to take his flag and take it to the top of the pole." And uh, so the man said, "Okay, sergeant." He's shooting at them all around. The man began to take the flag up top of the pole and the enemy shot him and cut him in half. Man fell down graveyard dead. Right Right there at the sergeant's feet. And he said, pointed to another man, said, Take his flag. We've got to get this flag up and let him know we've got victory. And uh, so they uh, sent a second one up there and said, uh, Send the flag. So they shot him, killed him. And the sergeant felt bad and said, I can't in my right mind send another man up that pole with that flag while they're killing him. And he said, Well, maybe we'll get a volunteer. And uh, they, he said, We got any volunteers? And there's an old boy from Arkansas over in the foxhole. And that old fella said, Hey, I'll do it in 22 minutes. And so the sergeant said, Okay. Okay, we'll wait 22 minutes. You can do it. And so in 22 minutes, that boy from Arkansas got up. He went over there and he said, give me the flag. He climbed up a pole and they're shooting all around him. They never got a scratch. He never got hurt. He never got shot. He got down and boy, the sergeant couldn't take it anymore. He said, how in the world did you do that? Them other men said, why don't you say let's wait 22 minutes? He said, y'all want to know why I had to wait 22 minutes? He said, I got a little old grandma and a little old mom over in Arkansas and they told me every morning at 4 o'clock and call up behind the wood stove and call my name in prayer. And he said, I knew as long as that crowd's are praying for me, I mean, everything's going to be all right. I'm telling you, neighbor, that God is answering prayer. And if you want to pull through, you may have to pray your way out. Thank God for answering prayer. I was preaching last night out of Luke 22. The Bible said, Jesus told Simon, he said, Satan had desire to eat and sift his wheat. <laughs> Do you know what that next phrase says? <laughs> he said, but I have prayed for thee. <laughs> oh, glory to God. I'm glad Jesus prayed for me. Amen. He prayed for me when I was lost. <laughs> he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. <laughs> when he was on the cross, we is on his mind. <laughs> this is an old bunch of drunk dopers, <laughs> and you ain't got to be a drunk or a doper to get saved. <laughs> you may have grown up on a church pew and never cussed, never smoked, never drank. You just had lost his hour. Hey, man of God, but Jesus prayed for you too. He prayed for us. Thank God I can't think of anybody else that I'd rather have praying for me right now. And that's a darling son of God. Pray. Number three, simple message. How to stay warm in a storm. Praise him. Pray. And then thirdly, participate. Do something. Can I get a witness right there? Oh, yes, I'm not a pastor. I've never pastored, but I, I try to bear a pastor's burden when I go sure. places and preach. And I sense a burden on the men of God I preach for. Every one of them got a group of people. Yes, they're faithful. They come, but they don't do nothing but show up. And we appreciate that. God bless you. Amen. Amen. They don't knock on doors. They don't pray. They don't tithe, they don't shout, they're just a bunch of wooden Indians sitting there on the pew like a knot on a log. Hey, man, I mean, you couldn't scare them into worshiping God. Wouldn't know God if he was to walk in and sit down in their lap. Hey, my boy, tell you, you want to bless your pastor? Participate. What can I do, man of God? Does a toilet need cleaning? Does a grass need mowing? I pull your wallet out and participate a little bit and get some fire about you and stay warm in the store. I'm a working man, I preach and I work also. And the best time to work is the winter. You get more done. During the summer when it's hot, you'll take a break every 30 minutes, go get you a drink of water and you need to. I ain't against that, especially if you're working hard. But during the winter, you can go all day without taking a water break. Amen, you'll get more done. 
You don't know why? Because you're trying to stay warm, keep that blood pumping. And I'm going to tell you what keeps a heart throbbing uh, uh, for God of the local church is to stay busy. Jesus said, but what wish you not that I must be about my father's business? Isn't there anything we can do for God? Can't we get excited about the grace of God and the work of God? I'm going to tell you we'd have revival. Hey, man, if, we, if God wouldn't have to be on the outside knocking to get into his own house. And when he did finally get the door open and he come in and found a group of people that was willing how to participate. They didn't listen to him to begin with, but Paul still got involved. Paul still participated. He got involved. How involved did Paul get in the ministry of this ship, this church? I tell you how involved in it. Bible does not say that he went to the bottom of that boat to pray, but the Bible does say after a long absence, we just we just presume that he went to the bottom of the boat, amen. And if he did, that means he got deeply involved in the work of that ship, in the ministry of that ship, in that ship making it to the other side. Can I get a witness right there? How involved are you in your local church? Can your pastor count on your smiling face to show up for door knocking? Can he count on your smiling face for bus ministry? Can he count on you when the pulpering plates go down the aisle? Can he count on you when it comes choir time? Can he count on you when it comes singing time? Oh, yes, I'm talking about deeply involved. Do we have to be involved in every ministry? You ought to be, amen. And if you're not, you ought to want to. And pray for that crowd that he has. Deeply involved. Have to stay warm and strong. Deeply involved. But then, not only was he involved, he was energetic. <laughs> Watch what when these people get their excited or excited. Hey, man, I can't help but preach it. God let me preach on them foxes over there in Luke Judges 15. I wasn't going to mention it. But them foxes, 300 foxes tied tail to tail. I preached one time on some telltale signs that somebody's on fire for God. Hey, Amen. And them foxes were definitely motivated by the fire that was on their tails. Amen. They were they wasn't one wild hair in a bunch. Amen to God. Yeah, but anyhow, that's what we need to do. Get energetic with the fire of God. Energetic with the work of God. Energetic up with what the Lord has got for us to do. Hey, I'll tell you, we need some energy in the church. And I'm talking about not I'm not talking about this Joel Osteen bunch of contemporary preaching mess. I'm talking about old fashioned independent Baptists that still got a King James Bible. I'll tell you, we shouted before the cares was ever uh, burped up out of the pit. We believed in worship before the Pentecostals came along. We believed in witnessing before the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, were ever burped up out of their heresy. I'm going to tell you we better get back uh, to having some energy uh, about the work of God. They were excited. Not only was he involved, not only was he energetic. I mean, he had something to say, but then thirdly, he was established. He said, except these stay with the ship, they cannot be saved. He was established in that. But I wonder how established you are in your local church. Amen. Somebody say amen right there. I'm talking about this is my church. And come hell or high water, I ain't moving. Unless I have to. And I begin this bunch of church hopping. I'd say if preachers would band together, we could stop some of this church hopping. Hey, man, if they can't get along with one preacher down the road because he's straight, they ought not be able to come over here and get along with this preacher. They ought to be preaching the same Bible. Say amen right there. They ought to be established in the local church. Established and be a church man with a church family. Hey, amen, and teach your children how to be lovers of the church and respect the church. It's ain't McDonald's play pen. Paul told Timothy, they ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Some folk ain't got no more respect for the church house. Sinners used to walk by and take the hats off and put the cigarettes out. Now you go to some churches, they got ashtrays on the front porch. That's an abomination of the God. Say, man, right there. Got a bunch of cigarette-sucking pastors, cigarette-sucking deacons. Somebody say, man. I'm telling you right now, that's an abomination. Y'all like preaching, don't you? Amen. Now don't get upset, me preaching against them cigarette sucking preachers and them bunch of compromising liberals. I didn't know that was in there, but there it is. Amen. We got ashtrays on the front porch. Amen. I mean, you go in, you see more flesh in the local church than you do at the beach half the time. 
Amen. The only difference between their music and country music is the words. Say amen. It's contemporary music, contemporary singers, an abomination unto God. I done, I done preached. He was established in the church. Amen. I ain't a moving. Be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. He said they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Just as I was addicted to liquor and beer and pot, I have been addicted to the work of God. Now, you see, I love nothing more than to stand and preach the word of God. This is my heart's desire, my heart's passion, not for vain glory, but God put it in me. And I tell you, I worry about these guys that say they're God called to preach and don't never want to preach. And they sit on a pew and they don't do nothing. And they're waiting on a preacher to die. Ain't too many street corners, too many nursing homes. There's too many radio ministries. Amen. Too much else to do. Establish. Now, I'll clarify something. Just because I believe in preaching on the street don't mean I'm as crazy and dumb as some of them other guys that do, amen? I believe you ought to take a good spirit in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where you go? Can I get a witness right there? Keep all your hate at the house. Yes, I hate sin. Why are you preaching? Is it to warn the wicked? No, it's to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that somebody might be saved. It will, buddy, it will. Are you going to take them off? No. Are you going to make them mad? No. I'm not chasing a bunch of sodomites all over the country. If they happen to come by the street corner I'm preaching on, and by the good grace of God, they will hear the blessed gospel and the blood and the doctrine of repentance. Yes, I'm going to preach against their sin. I'm going to do it that they might be saved. Something's wrong with somebody won't go up in a trailer park, knock on the door, and beg that crowd to come to church. Established. Yes. Yes. You'll be so established, you'll want other people to be established with you. Yeah. Right. Hey, man, boy, I'm preaching too long, Pastor. You're going to have to participate. Then lastly, I'm done. I didn't know all. I could preach right there for a while, but I'm, I'm done. You're going to stay warm and storm, praise the Lord. Pray. Participate. Last one, I'm done. Perseverance. He never gave up. Verse 31. He never gave up. But too many people quit. Amen. Quit. Preacher said something out there. I'm quitting. You ever, you ever seen it? Preacher didn't shake my hand. He must be mad at me. No, maybe he had a million things on his mind that he just forgot. I'm not a pastor, but I know one thing pastor ain't. It ain't babysitting. Amen. It ought not be anyway. But I guess the pastor has to play the role of babysitter. And then they accuse us evangelists of coming in, dumping our load, leaving it with a pastor. I had a preacher get upset at me one time. And he said, you just come in and dump your load. I said, throw to my date book. and said, you cancel every meeting I got. I'll stay with you and spread her out. He said, no, that's okay. No, I said, I'll cancel it all. I'll get me a job at the grocery store while I'm here or something. You ain't got to pay me or nothing. I'll get a tent and sleep outside. I'll help you spread this load out. Yeah. He started back, and I said, the problem is it hit too close to home, good lady. Yeah. And I just, I'm not a preacher basher, and I, I try to keep my pastors I preach for as my friends, and I do not intentionally make them look bad in front of their church. I'm against that. Hey, say amen right there. I'm not there to uh, make him look bad or I'm there to help him and get that congregation hooked up with that man of God and if there's any kind of problem with the relationship, try to get it mended back and get people on fire for God and win somebody to God, preach the Bible and stir up the saints of God. Amen. Is that right? Amen. We're going to have to persevere. I see it. Evangelist gets mad. He'll get upset. He'll go two or three weeks without a minute. Oh, I think I'm going to go pastor. Yep. Pastor has three or four months of tightness in the church. Oh, I think I'm going to go be an evangelist. <laughs> then when they get tired of being an evangelist, tired of being a pastor, well, I think I'm going to go be a missionary. <laughs> hey, the grass ain't no greener on either side. 
I'm where God put me. I didn't put myself in this business. I did. When I surrendered to preach, I surrendered to everything, missionary, pastor, and evangelism. And this is the door that God has opened for me. And if God ever wanted me to pastor, he'll have to put me to it. I won't lie to you, there's a desire in my heart to pastor. When I was walking out my mamaw's back door, one day I got the Holy Ghost and said, would you like to know why I have never let anybody offer you a position as a pastor? Why I have never let a church come to you wanting you to pastor? It's been about five or six years. I said, yes, Lord, I'd like to know that one. <laughs> he said, you'd have took it. I'd have got out of God's will. Now, if you hear Brother Morgan's pastor in a year from now, you better mark her down. It's God's will. I don't want to get out of God's will. And since then, I've had a couple come after me, and I just said, no, thank you. It's not the will of God. I'm where I'm supposed to be, and I'm content. I don't have to persevere. Every one of us, humanistically speaking, have had reasons. Human have probably had some good reasons to quit. I mean, my goodness, they're there on Sunday morning and they're not there Sunday night. And they ain't coming back. Get so discouraged, get in a storm and get so cold, but just persevere. Be like a hair in a biscuit and just hang in there. Right. <laughs> Amen. The best way I can tell. We're standing all over the building how to stay warm in the storm, Pastor. I, preached a little longer than I probably should have, thank you. But he didn't put a time limit on me, so I wasn't disrespectful. God bless you.